threaded inserts without an allen key or screw thread to get them back out again here's the fix just shove a screwdriver right in there thanks to the uh, people of woodworking uk facebook group for that tip that was um, great i spent hours trying to get those bloody things out I better chime in here. I'm making a quick sled because I need to cut a scarf joint on some really wide stock, that, you know, the legs of the base, because I don't simply have enough wood that's long enough. So I need to make those bits of wood longer. What I do have, of. you'll probably notice I'm only using one of the mitre slots for the runner for the sled. I can't be asked to mess around with two. Two of them, they can bind against each other. It's be a raw pain in the ass, and no point. Some smash out a mortise is pretty boring. All I'm doing here is smashing out the waist, getting close to where there's like two, three mil waist left. I'm not going to chisel all the way through to the other side. What's left of the two, three mil, I'll half and half again and use the combination square to check the walls of plumb and square. This gives me a flat face to reference the back of the chisel. Off, off. I'll step the cuts like an open mine. The waist on the bevel side of the chisel is your enemy. Remember that, because it pushes the chisel back to your line or past that line, which you don't want. To show you what I mean, there's about two mil of waste there to that line. Now I'm going to halve that, smash it out, sighting the chisel level, plumb, I suppose you'd call it. And I'll be honest with you, that's a bit risky taking one mil to your line. I'd, I'd rather half that, but <laughs> be honest with you, I know this is plywood, it's soft as shit, and the chisel isn't going to be shoved back past that line. To exaggerate my point, if this was the same case, but it was in a piece of hardwood like a bit of oak, and I put that chisel in on that line and try to smash the mallet, watch that move backwards. So that's a good half mil way back past your line. So uh, your mortise is going to be massive. When you're doing that, you want to sight the chisel. And if that chisel starts to move to the right and you see a, a dark gap appear, you know you're not chiseling, but straight downwards, you know, you're undercutting. When you're getting there and you're getting very close and you, you know you've got like a rizzle of paper to take off of that mortise walls then get out your nice sharp chisel and pair it nice and flat keep checking with your combination square that your walls are nice square as you go down use your combination square as well to check the depth if you're not doing a through mortise and then flip it over and finish that off really that's it when it comes to fitting you're gonna have to be like inspector gadget Columbo, whatever you've got to investigate what where is it where is it going wrong it could be so many different things as well it could you could have twisting it could be cocked off to the left or right all sorts of things but you've got to basically figure it out as you go and then that isn't easy you can use your tools like your combination square to work out what's square and you can honestly smash your head against brick wall thinking everything's square why isn't this working you might have a belly somewhere in your mortise for instance you might have a belly in your tenon you need to 
sort of do the maths and work it out as it were uh, there's no straight answer someone can tell you that this is what's wrong unless you're standing in front of what's been sawn and, and what's been chiseled out most of all those softly softly catchy monkey these small increments test fit small increments test fit and if if it gets bad really make it bad and then fix that to make it better and i make no pretense about it my chisel work sucks that looks like a ripped out fireplace but it's a tight fit probably wondering what all that green tape's about i label everything so when it comes to a glue up i know d goes with d a goes with a and so on saves a lot of swearing I doing this on the bandsaw those little thin strips of oak I can't really do on the painter and they're well handy to keep in your drawer somewhere because you never know when you're gonna f and those little shims can come in handy so don't just bob smash them out keep them call me a warlock but <coughs> sometimes you just get a bit lucky and you think I'm glad I did that as you can see coming out of here size two before you go ahead and do anything like this it's a good idea to do some test pieces first on the wood you're using in this case I've got three different dining tables so 
I can't be 100% sure. Well, I can be 100% sure none of this wood came from the same tree, so it is going to react differently to the ammonia. I can smell from sawing it. One smells like uh, French oak or European oak, whatever you want to call it. There's a comparison between the two. One's been fumed, one hasn't been, but they're of the same pieces of oak. It was actually the French oak in the end that gave me the most grief because it had very little tannic acid in it, almost to the point like beech does, which is about 15%, I think, beech. Um, so I had to come up with a plan, and that was to make my own tannic acid tea, which you see me doing here. I didn't film everything, and I can assure you, I think at the end I put a good half pot in that water, mixed that with warm water, and then just painted it on the wood, let it dry, and then uh, put it all in a tent with the ammonia. Even though I spent, I think, two weeks with doing test pieces, trying to get it all figured out. It still went horribly wrong. And I had to start again. 